Spirit that brings us revelation. Lord, as we sing, we do want the Holy Spirit to blow through here for your words to come alive, not for your word to go forth and accomplish what it was designed to accomplish. God, we're thankful that you've given us sonship, daughtership. Lord, that you are our Father, that you love us with an unconditional love that you gave your Son for us. Father, we just bless and we praise your name. besides me think that it is absolutely ridiculous how good of a worship time we have here. <laughs> I think that all the time that we are so blessed to have this kind of a worship team and this kind of a spirit. So I'm going to talk today on the fruit of the spirit and we'll determine if by the end of this message, if that was an appropriate title for the sermon or not. <laughs> because we're going to sort of walk together through some of my thought process. For people who don't know my thought processes, this could be a scary thing. For people who do know my thought process, this definitely will be a scary. But <clears throat> I just wanted to share some thoughts on the fruit of the Spirit. And one of the things I came to is, we have an innate desire built within ourselves, and I'm not talking about Christians, just we as people, to improve ourselves, to become better people. I believe that. I know that the self-help section of the bookstore is huge. They are the number one selling genre of books. Uh, we want to learn to do things, develop better skills, be better people. But we're Christians. So we have to do that a little bit on the holier side. So we go to the Bible and say, well, what does the Bible say would make me a better person? And, of course, we would come to Galatians 5, 22 through 23, and most people know this scripture either by a song or just by strict memorization. I'm a strict memorization person because I don't have Amy's gift even in the slightest. So I don't sing anything. I don't sing the books of the Bible. I don't sing any of those songs that they try to teach me as a kid. But we learn the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And I know the translation I put up there says long-suffering instead of patience. But I learned it as patience. So I, probably I am incapable of reading it without saying patience instead of long-suffering because it is so baked into my brain. So we read this out of the Bible and we say these are the kind of character traits that God would want me to have. Obviously, if this is the fruit of the Spirit, then this is how I'm supposed to be. And so we, we think, how do I develop these character traits or how do I develop these skills? And that is the first mistake that we make when looking at this passage is we've confused the fruit of the Spirit for skills or we've confused them for character traits because that's not what they are. Part of that, I think, is simply because we don't talk this way so much. We don't talk about the fruit of what we're doing. We don't refer to our children as the fruit of our loins anymore. We don't talk about fruit of anything. You know, we just don't do that. The only time we talk about fruit is when we want an apple or a banana or something like that, or we're thinking of fruit smoothies. And we don't think of fruit the same way that the Bible talked about fruit when they talked about the fruit of the Spirit, or they would talk about fruit in many different ways. We look at the fruit of the Spirit, and we tend to think of it as, as traits that we have to develop in our lives. And that brings me to a phrase that I had heard a little bit, but I've heard it more here than I have anywhere else, and it's called performance-based acceptance. And people will just say PBA, and we throw that around. And all that means, performance-based acceptance, means that, that we feel we have to do something in order to be accepted by God. Now, I'm not going to be preaching on performance-based acceptance, so I'm not going to go into a diatribe of why that is not biblical 
and how that's not sound, I want you just to go ahead and believe that with me right now if you don't. And if you don't believe it, then I invite you to come and have a conversation with me afterwards. But for right now, we're just going to go ahead and go on that and say that's not true. Now, when we know that we cannot earn God's love for salvation, we know that. So we come into to it, and, we, and, and you hear people all the time say, there's nothing we can do to earn God's love. There's nothing we can do to make God love us less, nothing we can do to make him love us more. He just loves us. And we believe that for salvation, but for some reason we think, but throughout this journey of becoming a Christian, that I need to strive to prove myself to God on a continual basis. Even though we may profess, we understood that salvation was by grace, you know, not of faith, or it's of faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. But then for some reason, the living of it out becomes a doing or a getting better. When we discredit performance-based acceptance, almost always someone comes to me and quotes James 2.20 and says, well, what do you do about this? James 2.20 says, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Now, is this proof, this verse, proof that works are required, or is it simply something else? It actually sounds familiar to me. It, it brings to my mind something Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. He said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Basically, what that verse is just saying is a tree, by its nature, produces fruit. If it's a tree, it produces fruit. If it's a good tree, it produces good fruit. A bad tree produces bad fruit. So I want to go back to what James was saying when he said faith without works is dead. What is really happening here is that James is saying that works are a response to our faith. When we have faith, it produces works. But this is not a thing saying that works are required for our salvation or for our loving God. It's just that the works we do, the things that we do, are a response because of our faith. And there is a very big difference between doing the works and having faith that produces works. If there is no response, what James is saying, then the faith is dead. It's just like a tree. That's how you can tell. But don't confuse what's happening here. We grow the tree, not the fruit. In James 2.18, we're backing up just a little bit from 2.20, he says, but someone will say, well, you have faith, but I have works. Show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. James is saying it's impossible to demonstrate faith by you doing the work. But I can show you my faith based on the fruit of my life, based on what's happening, what is being poured out of me. So the works are a symptom. Now I'm going back to the fruit of the Spirit. So if the fruit of the Spirit is not a skill, it's not a character trait, then what are they? The fruit of the Spirit are byproducts or symptoms. And I like calling them symptoms. Now, we use, we, we use this kind of terminology a lot when people are sick. We will say things all the time like, you're treating the symptom but not the cause, or something like that. You're treating the symptoms, not the disease. Okay? Now, of course, I'm putting this sort of into a negative light, comparing the fruit of the Spirit with the symptoms of a cold. But it's true. And almost everything we do in life is sort of trained at treating the symptoms. We take cough suppressants, nasal decongestants. We do all these kind of things to relieve the symptoms. If I'm sneezing, I'll take an allergy pill. But I haven't done anything to relieve the allergies. Or I haven't done, if I'm taking cold medicine, it, it doesn't actually work to defeat the cold. All it does is it removes the symptoms so that you can function. But you haven't done that. Now, conversely, 
if I decided I wanted to have a cold, which I don't, <laughs> I could sit there and I could cough, and I can make myself sneeze. I am one of the few people that can actually make myself sneeze, but I won't do it on a microphone. And you could sniff and cough and sneeze and lay in bed and feel tired, but that doesn't mean you have a cold. That just means you have the symptoms of a cold. And most likely, you're having to work to maintain those symptoms. But I'm telling you, when you have a cold, you don't have to work to cough or to sneeze or to sniff. And Oh, my goodness, you do not have to work to sniff. Man, I hate sniffing. I just feel like it's not pouring down the back of my throat. That is a terrible analogy for what is happening here, and yet it's so appropriate. <laughs> when we have the Spirit in our lives, we can't help but manifest the fruit. We don't have to work for it. Now, if we don't pursue the fruit, how do we get that? So let's back up from Galatians 5.22 all the way to Galatians 5.16. And this is one of the more, in my mind, ethereal verses in the Bible. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, in between 16 and 22, Paul gives a very good description of what walking in the flesh looks like. It's ugly. He then gives a description of what, looking, of what walking in the Spirit looks like, and that's the fruit of the Spirit. Now, again, I want to emphasize, a lot of us take that out. In fact, I, I have seen more marquees around town, and, and I'm not doing this as judgment because I don't know what they're preaching, but I've seen more marquees around town that I'm guessing because it's summer and people have fruit on their mind, watermelon things and, you know, just summer fruits that maybe they all wanted to preach on fruit of the Spirit. It's amazing. I fell right in there. I don't know. But, <clears throat> but I've noticed that they tend to be pulling one out and saying, let's concentrate on this and let's concentrate on this. And, and I think it's wise to understand what they are. I don't think it's wrong to study peace or to study joy or love or these things and just to understand what the Bible says about it or how to recognize it in people. But it is completely different than trying to cultivate that in your life. Now, I could try to develop on my own patience, and I could probably learn some skills that would help me to appear more patient, and I could get to be a more patient person so that when someone's talking to me and they're going longer than I really wanted to, I could develop the ability to stand there and say, yes, mm, that's good, yes, and I could be patient. But I doubt that there's any program out there or any set of teaching out there that would teach me to stop calling people idiots when they cut me off in traffic. Because I don't have that kind of patience in me. But when I am walking in the Spirit, I do. And I don't lose my patience. And I don't, you know, have all these things. I start to display the fruit of the Spirit the more I'm walking in the Spirit. So this is an ethereal concept, walking in the, in the Spirit. I mean, just, you know, we say it, just walk, just walk in the Spirit. That's all you got to do. Well, what is walking in the Spirit? In John 15, 4 through 5, he gives it another way, which is probably just as ethereal. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So it's again, Jesus is reemphasizing that the more we're connected in him and abiding in him, the more we're going to bear fruit. And that fruit is the fruit of the Spirit. It's also other things. You know, the Bible does talk about other fruit that comes out of us. James talked about it as works, but we'll get into that in a little bit. In Galatians 6, 7 through 8, I want to start getting into what does this mean, abiding in God or walking in the Spirit. I actually think that those are synonymous. I don't believe that those are two separate things. They're just phrased differently. In Galatians 6, 7 through 8, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. 
For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap. I whistle sometimes when I talk. It just happens. Will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And basically what he's saying here is he's starting to get some practical application to this concept of walking in the Spirit. Uh, it still sounds a little churchy for us because we don't think of sowing and reaping so much. We don't live in an agricultural society. But, and so when we think of the concept of sowing and reaping, we think about what church generally talks about, which is you know, tithing. And this does not have anything at all to do with tithing. All this is saying is whatever we're putting our attention to, whatever we're investing in, whatever we're putting our life to, that we're going to get back. Are we putting it towards the things of the flesh, the things of the world? Or are we putting it towards the things of God, the things of the Spirit? And so now it's starting to get a lot more practical. Where is my attention? What does my time look like? Yeah, we have things like uh, I have to go to work. And so, you know, is my work, well, for me, I work at a you know, church, <laughs> so... It's not necessarily a secular experience, although I do have a company that I do work for, and, and that's not necessarily a Christian-based organization. But, you know, a lot of people will say things like, well, I'm doing something here that's specifically a secular thing, or if I'm involved in this or that. Well, that's not what this is talking about. This isn't saying the more time you spend in church, you're walking in the Spirit, and the more time that you're not, you're walking. That has nothing to do with it. This is about our mind. Just about everything that's, that happens is going on in our mind. The reason for that is, in case you ever wonder, is when you got saved, you got a new person inside of you. Okay? You got the Spirit of God in you. So your spirit is righteous, holy, perfect, loves the things of God. That's the Spirit of God. But we also have a mind that remembers everything from before we got saved continually has input from the world going into it, all this other stuff. So the Bible talks about the transforming of your mind. And that's what has to happen. And that's what we're talking about here. In Colossians 3, chapter 2, it says, Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. That is simply, we, we've heard it here. There's a lot of teachings here where we talk about above the line or below the, below the line thinking where anything that's above the line is the things that are eternal, that are matter, that are permanent, the things of God. This is eternal truths. These are the promises of God. Things below the line are things that are temporary. Now, it's not that one is more real than the other. In fact, they're both just as real. We go through life and we see things on this certain level. We experience tragedies, we experience wonderful things, we experience people talking, just all different levels, and that's all kind of below the line stuff, but there's always a truth, there's something above the line that's going on, something that God is doing. In Colossians, we're being encouraged to look at the things that are happening above the line. What is God doing in this situation? And that's a good way to keep your mind up there in the spirit, is always asking, what's God doing in this situation? Why Am I feeling this way or what is happening with these people or what's going on? And that's above the line thinking. Philippians 4.8, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The more I practice that and put that into my life, the more I find that I'm doing this ethereal thing of walking in the Spirit. It's actually being lived out in my life. Tina and I, my wife, go on walks frequently. And when we go on, on long walks, we like to really talk about the things of God. And we just really get back and forth and talking about what God's doing in our lives and, and what new revelations have we gotten, what, God, what is God teaching us right at this moment, and how does that apply to our lives, and how do we live out this thing that God's showing us, and what do we do? And all that kind of just talking it out and doing it is so much better for keeping our mind transformed into the things of God than talking about the last thing we binge watched on Netflix. 
and it's amazing. But we stay more in the things of God. Now, I had a recent uh, episode with my air conditioner a few months ago, and it went out and completely just gone. So we had to get the guy to come out and look at it, and it was going to be a big deal. And so he was going to have to, you know, fix it, and it was going to be a large amount of money. And, uh, and so when he gave me the news, I said, well, we've got to, uh, you know, we're going to do it. We're in Florida. So, you know, go ahead and fix it. And that was pretty much the end of it. And Tina came over to me, and, she, and this is after the guy left. And she said, I'm so proud of you. And I'm like, why? Well, in the past, I would have spent a significant portion of time complaining about how whenever we get a certain amount of money saved up, something always happens and takes it away. Or whenever this is going, then something comes in and just destroys it. Or, you know, I can't believe that this always happens. And I get frustrated and I get mad and I get angry and I get whatever else. And she said, you were just, you, you were calm you were peaceful. It didn't break your joy. You just went on with your day. You said, well, we have to deal with this. We dealt with it, and it, and we, and it didn't take away any of my joy or my peace. I walked in it. And I took no, thank you. I, you know, every now and then I get a victory. <laughs> so I've had this pattern in my life of when things go wrong or not according to the way that I think they should. You know, I sort of plan things out. Sometimes I'll plan for things to break or whatever, but not often, definitely not often enough. And when things would go outside of my plans, then I react. And my reactions have generally been poor. But lately, Tina and I have made a conscious effort that we are going to walk in the Spirit by whatever that, that means. And for us, it means having a lot of discussion. That may not be what it means for you, but for us it is. For you, it could look totally different. It might be whether you're spending that time in prayer or whether you're spending that time, uh, you know, in a Bible study or reading God's Word or just meditating on good things or, uh, you know, having fellowship with good friends. For us, it's, it's a lot of discussion and those other things, too, that go into it, but primarily that. And it did not escape our notice that the more I was doing that, the more I was walking in the fruit of the Spirit. Now, here's the interesting thing. I had something that should have triggered me. That's one of my triggers, something that messed with my plans. That's a trigger. It should have triggered me, but it didn't. The weird thing is I didn't work on building patience. I didn't work on building joy. I didn't work on any of the fruit of the Spirit. That isn't what I was doing. I didn't have any books telling me how to have more patience when things don't go according to my plan, and I didn't have anything telling me how don't complain because of this. All I did was I spent time with God. And God, during that time, never brought up to me and said, you know, you've got to work on your reactions. He never did that. All God did was talk to me about, in fact, what we had been talking about during that time was, understanding my position as his child. In fact, kind of what we sang about in No Longer Slaves. And God is speaking to us about our position as his children and what that really means. And suddenly I find myself exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> I wanted to go back to works versus fruit again. Because I've seen a lot of conversation, online particularly, about what the highest calling a Christian can have. Now, everyone has an opinion, and everyone with an opinion has several scriptures to back up their opinion, which is amazing because everyone using the same word of God to, to declare that they're the right one. But um, <laughs> every one of these tends to be, in my mind, we're confusing a passionate response with a calling. Okay, now I think it's wonderful that, that missionaries believe that being a missionary and evangelizing is the highest calling that a Christian can have. I think it's wonderful because that's their calling and that's what they're out there doing. 
I think it's wonderful that an intercessor believes that the highest thing that a Christian can do is spend that time in prayer. And they just, you know, really get passionate about it. Now, it was not at this church, but it was at another church where I actually had about three or four different Christians getting into a pretty heated argument over what was more important. Where we had one guy who just felt like if you're not evangelizing and you're not sharing your faith, you're just not doing it. I mean, you're not being a Christian. And then this other person was like, well, that's crazy because if you're not praying, and, and then they said, and even you think evangelism, well, we're praying the people into the kingdom. And that's what's most important. And then somebody else was like, you know, study to show yourself approved unto God. You know, if you're not studying and teaching and declaring the truth and the principles, then how are people ever going to grow? We're supposed to make disciples of all nations. And there's this conflict. What I noticed is every single one of those things, which are good things, which are wonderful things, which are awesome things, and I applaud people for having that passion, but every one of those things is works. And if you're doing that because you believe that that's what God is, is going to be so happy and pleased and that that's how you define yourself as a Christian, you, you kind of missed it. The highest calling that a Christian can have, and I'm going to base this off of the fact that everything God wants to do in us doesn't require us to do anything. God has done it all for us. The highest calling a Christian can have is to be loved by God. When you can fully accept the love of God in your life and you start to grasp and understand how much God loves you, you will have a response. And that response will come out of your unique gifts and passions. And it may manifest as a missionary, as a prayer warrior, as a teacher, and all these things. But the truth is, the passion comes from accepting the love of God and realizing that you are loved unconditionally, absolutely, completely by God. Now, I don't want to spend too long on that because we had a guy named Trevor who was here who taught on the Father's heart, and he did it in a way that I can't do it. And he's got a great gifting for that. But I wanted to bring that up because it's so important to what we're talking about. In Psalm 37, 4, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. When it says he'll give you the desires of his heart, uh, there are people that interpret that one of two ways. One meaning whatever you are desiring, God will give you. The other way to interpret it is that God will give you the desires that you're desiring. He'll put those desires in you. And then I'll hear people say, now, which one do you think is right? Is it one or is it two? And that's a trick question. They're both right. Because what happens is God puts his desires in you. He puts the desires in you, and then he gives you those desires. So when it's done properly, God gives it to you. He gives both to you. And it's a wonderful thing. So if the highest calling of a Christian is to accept the full love of God, we are not set up for failure. If the highest calling that a Christian can have would be to be a missionary, then every one of us who hasn't sold everything and moved out onto the field has failed. If the highest calling of God is to be a, a prayer warrior, then every time that we don't devote those three or four hours a day into prayer, we fail. But if the highest calling of God is to be loved by God, we can't fail at that because God loves you. And he doesn't stop loving you and he doesn't mess it up. God gets it done. All we have to do is accept it. And everything that we do out of that is a response to that love. Now, this is the same thing. We're, we're very, very familiar with this when we first fall in love. And it could happen at any time. It could happen in the second grade with your second grade teacher. <laughs> it could happen, you know, as a teenager. We got to see a great example of love here yesterday with Isaiah and Brittany getting married. Yes. When you, when you fall in love, you, for some reason, want to do something. You know, at some point in grade school, you 
you want to write a note to them or you want to get flowers and do something, you know, there's some, something. You can't just sit there and say, well, I'm in love and do nothing. It, it just doesn't happen to anyone. You, it's like suddenly you want to do something. And that's how it is with God. That's how the works are with God. It's not anything that we're doing. It just happens to be this response. The reason that it looks different, the reason we have missionaries and prayer warriors and evangelists and teachers and preachers and pastors and all this stuff is because God puts unique passions and giftings into each one of us. And then our response comes because of the uniqueness of how God made us. It's manifest differently. And that's how come we as a body come together and every need is met, every work is done, everything that's needed is right there. It's almost like God's plan is good. <laughs> now, we have, we have, because of Night of Worship, we've brought up a lot of John 17. And I really appreciate Pastor Roger. And he puts up, the, you know, we all, we're the answer to John 17 because we all want to be one. And it's this unity of bringing all believers together. And that is awesome. And that is amazing. But I want to look at the very last verse of that prayer. This is John 17, 26. Jesus says, I have declared, declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. The absolute culmination of Jesus' prayer. Now, this is, this is like the prayer of Jesus. This is, you know, just before he's going off to be crucified. This is, if he's going to spend his time in prayer, this is what he's going to pray and he does. He goes through and prays this whole thing about how they can all be one. And at the very end, it culminates with that the love with which you love them, loved me, would be in them and I in them. That's where I'm drawing this from. That the ultimate culmination of what Jesus' desire for every one of us is, is that the love of the Father would be in you. So who am I? I'm made in the image of God. His love gives me identity. I'm unconditionally loved, and I can respond to that love. In Romans 8, 9, it says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Basically meaning, you know, this is for Christians. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So... We as Christians, we don't move in the flesh, we move in the Spirit. The reason I said I don't know if the fruit of the Spirit was a great title for this is, as you see, we've moved far away from it. I actually could teach the entire way to develop the entire fruit of the Spirit in one sentence. Spend time with God. You don't have to worry about how to love people. How do I have joy in any situation? How do I maintain peace? How do I have kindness? How can I be kind to people? Has anyone ever done a spiritual giftings test? I've done them. I've done them for years and years and years. And uh, I always test, tested the same. Now, I haven't done one in the last four or five years. But interestingly enough, uh, there is a, the gift of encouragement is on there and mercy is on there. And what would happen for me is I would have you know, some scores of the various gifts that they would put out there. And when it got to those two, I bottomed out. And I mean, like, like not just bottomed out, but, like, didn't even register. <laughs> well, I'm not very encouraging and don't seem to have much mercy. <clears throat> and for years, I sort of looked at that as an excuse. Well, that's okay. That's how God made me, right? And so I can look at what I am strong at and what I'm good at, and therein lies another problem. Because I look at what I can do. What can I do? Now, again, I, I started coming to this church, and I started hanging around uh, when I first came here because I came on staff. The first two people that I really got to hang around with was Pastor Roger and Tim Downey. And I started seeing some things in their lives, and I started looking at them and going, wow. You know, they, they exhibit a lot of traits that I struggle with, particularly encouragement and mercy. 
And I kind of wondered, I wonder, you know, what's their secret? What's their secret? I don't, you know, I don't, I don't get it. But throughout just l- sitting there and learning stuff, and I started learning a lot about being, you know, and I've been a Christian for pretty much my whole life. And I started learning about just abiding in God and just spending time with him and just being with God. Now, I hadn't talked to them about my spiritual gifting tests and assessments and things like that. And so we went on for several months, and I was really learning a lot. And God was just giving me all these revelations, and I was just, and God was giving me so many revelations. And Tina and I would go out, and we would just start talking about these revelations, and we were getting very, very excited about what God was doing. And at some point, I shared with them, I said, you know, one of the things I've always struggled with is encouragement and mercy and things like that. And I remember Tim looking at me and going, really? You're like one of the most encouraging people I know. And I'm thinking, what? (laughs) And I started thinking about it. I was like, you know, I have been saying encouraging things to people. And suddenly I'm not looking at people and seeing flaws. I'm looking at people and seeing how awesome God made them. And that's starting to come out. And again, I never worked on that. I did not purpose to try to become more encouraging. It was a byproduct. And so what I've started to learn and what I just wanted to pass on to you, and I know we, we hear this kind of thing a lot, particularly from this church, but it's not everywhere, is that it's not working on bettering ourselves. It's not spending that time on how can I be, how can I do, how can I these things, because all that happens is the more I spend my time concentrating on how do I become more encouraging, I forget how to be more kind. Oh, I better start looking at kindness, and now I forgot about how to share my faith. And, oh, wait, but now I can't. There are too many things in the Christian life to learn, to do, to master them all, but they will all come out as a natural response of doing one thing, (laughs) walking in the Spirit. And so... What I want is to, to have that walking in the Spirit not be a mystery, not be something that feels that that's out there. Like, can, can somebody really just walk in the Spirit? It's nothing more than turning our attention to God. It's nothing more than looking at His promises and His truths rather than looking at the circumstances we find ourselves in. We all want to be more like Christ, and we want the fruit of the Spirit to be abundant in our lives. But we don't pursue that fruit. That's human thinking. Human thinking says, how do you want to be? Pursue that. Uh, We want more kindness. Act more kind. Just that phraseology right there should tell you that that is not putting kindness in you. When we say act kind, it's an act. Instead, we envelop ourselves in the spirit. We keep our mind on things above, not on things of the earth. And the more we do this, the more that the fruit comes into our lives. Now, that whole thing about our calling, I know that didn't have anything to do with the fruit of the Spirit. That's kind of like bonus material because I had to fill up time because, like I said, I could do my whole sermon in one sentence. (laughs) But But it is so true. We are loved by God, and everything we do is a response to that love. I'm going to invite the worship team to come on back up and I'm uh, going to draw this to a close. I want you to take this time that we're going to have as we go into ministry time and really look at, at ourselves. And are there things in our lives, areas in our lives where we struggle and say, I never can seem to get better at whatever it is, particularly talking about the Christian life. Don't, not talking about I never can seem to get better at playing the piano. That actually is a skill that you should practice. (laughs) But those things of God and the calling in our lives. And people who say things like, wow, I just don't want to miss God's calling in my life. Understand you can't miss it. God loves you. That's your calling is to be loved by God. Your response to that, which we mistake oftentimes for our calling, is just that. It's our response to God. You won't miss his calling. So any time that you've struggled with those thoughts of how am I going to miss his calling or 
how can I be better at this or that? Really look at yourself and think, have I been pursuing the fruit or have I been pursuing the work or have I been pursuing that instead of pursuing God and spending that time? The great thing about God is these things don't take any time at all to, to put back on track. You just simply spend that time with God, you put it back in God, and it's, you're right there. When we try to build the skills or, or look at the fruit of the Spirit in our lives as a skill, it would take a lifetime to develop that. Spend time in God, and when you're in the presence of God, which we always are, but you know what I mean, and a situation happens that tests us, we react with the fruit on the spot instead of in our flesh. No practice required. So I just want to encourage you to really look at taking our minds and transforming it into the things of God. This is not an ethereal thing. This does not mean that 24-7 you're talking about the things of God. It just means that we're cognizantly aware that God is always here. He's in us. He's around us. That when we're in conversations with people, we're looking and listening to the Holy Spirit. We're aware that there's more happening than just what we see.